everybody else is in the game, they just don't know it. So like the police are part of the game too. So if you're doing something you're not supposed to do and you encounter the police, it's like they're not your enemy, they're just, you know, the, the, they're the other team in the game and you have to be smarter than them. Spoke to him today from jail in Arizona and Larry, we know had, he had to know the risks that were associated with this. The catacombs of Paris, hundreds of miles of tunnels filled with the skulls and bones of millions of people. Imagine somewhere as extensive as the New York City subway, but abandoned and used as a graveyard. Who wouldn't be fascinated? I read about these people called cataphiles, whose mission it was to explore and map out the catacombs. They would create art, host parties, even set up illegal underground movie screenings. According to the article I read, right as the Paris police were about to raid the catacombs, they went to the spot and only found a note that said, do not try to find us. Who were these people? I was fascinated. I went down an obsessive internet rabbit hole and discovered urban exploration. People exploring subway tunnels, wading through drains, climbing bridges, trekking through monumental abandoned structures, even whole abandoned cities. And I realized there is a lot more to the world than I could have ever imagined. Nine out of 10 people, when they were a kid, they snuck into the tunnel down at the end of the street, or they went into the ghost house that was abandoned, you know, or they went into the abandoned barn and had a beer, you know, drank beer with their friends on their team. Everybody's done it, urban exploring, right? Everybody's done it, sneak into the cemetery at night, you know, uh, all of that. So climb on a rooftop and, you know, smoke a joint with your friends or whatever. That's urban exploring. Everybody's done it. When people say, why do it? You know, the answer at its core is because it's just a boatload of fun. Uh, and I think people really kind of get that. And I can give you lots of other nicer sounding reasons about educating yourself about the city and, you know, testing the limits of the built environment. And, you know, like a, you can do that angle, but like, really, it's just a blast. People instinctually get why it's fun and why it's neat and why you want to do it. So the question is really, why not do it? And the reason why not do it is because it's dangerous and can get you arrested. If you ask a hundred people, you know, would it be fun to hang out on top of the Brooklyn Bridge? I don't want to say a hundred of them would say yes, but you know, probably like 90 something would. In my research, I discovered the godfather of modern urban exploration. Ninjalicious, a.k.a. Jeff Chapman, a Canadian engineer and urban explorer who is instrumental to urban exploring. Meet our tour guide from Toronto, who calls himself Ninjalicious. He's just one of hundreds of urban explorers around the world, where exploring places you shouldn't be is the way to see a city. He was obviously one of the first high-profile people and one of the first people to like have stuff on the internet. And, you know, I think it was a very good way to, to kind of kick that all off. A lot of equate urban exploration with the exploration of abandoned spaces. And uh, for me, that's a fascinating but small branch of the whole hobby. I think that uh, the exploration of active schools, churches, hospitals, hotels, office buildings, train stations, and all of that sort of thing is uh, really a lot more rewarding. I remember we was talking about something in the Toronto subway, and he was like, it is very cool. I really must insist you check it out. And like, you know, the whole vibe of the site and I would assume him personally, although I, I, you know, I never met him was like, you too can do this fun hobby. He helped define and categorize terms within the hobby that we still use today. Part of what Ninj did that was so important was formally define what urban exploring is, as well as help create an online urban exploration forum, which has been seen by hundreds of thousands of people and by migrating the hobby online, changing the nature of it forever. The waves of urban exploration have coincided with the waves of technology to disseminate the urban exploration. So, you know, in our era, it was very much like, oh my God, we're gonna make websites. Like we all had like, we all tried to make like little individual websites and we'd have, uh, you know, like a few things and some pictures and some stories. And, you know, before people started making websites, people did zines and there was a whole like, you're going to put this in a zine and send it out to people. In the 70s, finding a person, finding a really good weirdo was really hard. 
really hard to find somebody who was into the stuff that you were into. Yeah, the good part of social media is it's not rare anymore. You can immediately find a hundred people around the world who are really into that. Boom, just like that. You can look at it and do it on your phone right now. That's a miracle. To find people who you have a genuine shared interest with, an obscure interest that most people could give a fuck about, that's a, that's a gift. That's an amazing thing. I started exploring the hidden alleys and rooftops of my neighborhood. I didn't carry a camera with me, I just explored for its own sake. Then I tried to find local abandoned spots. Eventually, the spots I explored expanded to drains, subway tunnels, bridges, and construction sites. Seven years after reading that article about the catacombs, I flew to Paris. Now, there was some tension about exploring the catacombs. Earlier that week, a group of teenagers got lost, and some dogs had to be sent to find them. The boys were hypothermic, but alive. Like, I still say the cat is our, the coolest place in the world. And B, especially if it's like, you know, your first time exploring out of the country and, you know, you've heard about it and it's like this mythical place, like, you know, and figuring it out yourself. Like when we went there, we didn't have a guide. We were just kind of like, oh, are we going in this tunnel or what's, what's up? I'm not against the idea of private property. In fact, I think places like your house, vehicle, or tent should be spots where you can post up with a certain expectation of privacy. But if there's a bit of decaying land that hasn't been touched in decades, you have to wonder what's going on. New York has become like that in many areas, where they will have security cameras and razor wire fences around vacant lots that have absolutely nothing valuable inside them. Security theater is everywhere. It's, uh, you know, what what the government and private actors do to make you think that they're doing something. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's something that after 9-11 became very prevalent and kind of took me and I think took a lot of people a little while to catch on to. New York City at that time was like somebody had shot a fucking wasp nest with a fucking 12-gauge shotgun. There were helicopters flying all over the place, people, cops everywhere. People were like flipped the fuck out. And then after 9-11, it was, you know, it got this, the vibe of the whole city changed, you know, it was a very, like, you just felt oppressed. Like, I don't know how to put it, you know, the, and it wasn't 9-11 so much as it was the stupid fucking Republican convention in 2004. Like that was the worst. That was like that, it, like post 9-11 was not the nadir of the security state. The Republican convention was the nadir of the security state where it was like them demonstrating, like we can lock down the entire city if we have to. The vibe in those like 03, 04, Oh, five, you know, those kind of years was like, it was bad and it was risky. And it was, you know, we, it was like, you know, we all wanted to climb the Brooklyn bridge and we were like, we're going to get shot. Given this paranoid culture, one of the biggest shocks you can give to Americans who often can't even fathom the concept of land belonging to nobody is to tell them about countries where property isn't really a concept. This is Norway a Scandinavian country in Northern Europe that considers the right to roam wherever you please in the wilderness a human right. In fact, right to roam even means you can hike, camp, and forage on someone else's land, so long as you're not destructive and don't disturb animals and land. Just make it seem like you were a ghost. This is reflected in the wilderness exploring phrase that has been adapted to urban exploration. Leave nothing but footprints, take nothing but photographs. These kinds of laws emphasize individual responsibility. If we went into even abandoned buildings, we wouldn't crash them. We didn't do any tagging. Nothing gets tagged, but we didn't do any tagging. We didn't do any, any vandalism. We didn't do anything like that. And it was by philosophical, it was philosophical concepts. Like we're using this space. We don't own it. So we're borrowing it and we're gonna leave it exactly how we found it. And nobody will know that we were there. To get into the catacombs, we had to pop a manhole by a busy cafe and hike three quarters of a mile down a utility tunnel. Even though there was a 100 degree heat wave when I went, the catacombs hover at a comfortable 57 degrees year round. Now, the catacombs are a surreal place. There's no light, no sound, no cell service, with sections that are flooded and lead into forgotten rooms. So you better know what you're doing when you go down there. We explored the sites of the catacombs, World War II bunkers, a crawl space filled with bones, tombstones, and a spot where water carved out a fountain basin. 
Most chilling of all, I found a note in French from the two boys who were lost earlier that week that read, search for us. This was it, the culmination of why I wanted to explore in the first place, to see things like this. And seven years after reading that article, I had finally done it. I think most people are natural explorers. I think they start out as natural explorers and they start out as, as a sort of a natural uh, creative people and they start out as uh, you know, compassionate and able to interconnect with other people and it's beaten out of them by the time they're about eight years old. I'm a taxpayer. I pay for public works. They're as public as the streets are. And I really think it's incumbent upon the city to give some type of access to the public for that for anything, you know, that's public works that our tax dollars have gone to. That doesn't mean everybody should just be allowed to kind of wander into the sewage treatment plant and be like, what? I pay my taxes. You know, it's not 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 quite like that. But, you know, it's the idea that, you, you know, you should you should do some school group trips. You should do some organized tours. You know, you should and, and you should take some pride in it. She, Geo Wizard, Vagrant Holiday, owe a lot of their success to the urban exploring community that came before them. There's a whole spectrum, and the spectrum goes from like the total like lockdown, controlled, never fucking print a photo ninja types who like want to go to the most extreme abandoned places ever and don't talk about it except to the people they know. It goes from there to the 15 year old Instagram kids who it, it's become a cultural thing for them to want to go and take a picture of themselves, selfie of themselves hanging off of a radio tower from their fingernails. So that's the whole spectrum. And it's everybody in between. We were having the exact same arguments about putting stuff on our websites that everybody is having about putting stuff on Instagram or making YouTube videos. The tricky thing with this business with, you know, urban exploration is like, you never know when they're really going to bring the hammer down on someone and you know the someone might be you they took down my door with a battering ram Ooh. right and then you know like put some padlocks on there that they drilled into the the door in the door frame and i open it up and my apartment has just been ravaged we just trespassed yeah but they spent you know 300,000 pounds i don't know 400,000 dollars of taxpayer money to run this prosecution so they were going to see it to the end drifter shoot says he saw a chopper in the air and state troopers driving backwards on the highway and then this happened you know, one one to the back of my head and said that they were arresting me on a nationwide warrant. Arrested for climbing One World Trade Center at the age of 16. He pleaded guilty to breaking a city law against scaling tall buildings without permission. Well, even if a fraction of the people who see all this stuff want to do it, it'll, you know, it'll, it's enough to keep it all going. Uh, I'm always, you know, everybody nowadays gets into places we could never get into. You know, the game has definitely like been up since I've been out of it to the point where I'm like, I don't understand how you can up the game much more than you've upped it. Um, but I'm sure somebody will. I see it not going away. Like you can't kill it anymore. I'm going to finish off with a quote from a Facebook post written by Steve Duncan. It says, view from the George Washington Bridge, the very first bridge I ever climbed legally. Just about 10 years after I had first climbed it without permission, I had developed a reputation as a photographer who climbed bridges. And I was working as a freelance photographer. So when the New York Post did an article about electricians replacing the lighting on the bridge cables, they sent me along with the full permission and approval of the Port Authority, which operates the George Washington Bridge. This just goes to show that sometimes, if something is the right thing to do, but it happens to be against the law, Sometimes you should just do it, and eventually the rest of the world will catch up. I think that the, uh, the secret part of the city is generally much more interesting than the, the open to the public part. If you know what's going on uh, under the streets, you know, you know there are another four levels of city underneath the one that you're walking on, uh, it really adds a lot to your understanding of the world you live in, I think.